Okay, hi everyone. So today we're going to be talking about debugging and testing. To follow along in the Stormy Attaway book, I suggest that you take a look at chapter 6. And uh, in particular, we're looking at uh, section 6.5, debugging techniques. All right, so like I've said all semester, what's really important to remember is that in any engineering or science work that you do, mistakes are normal and they happen. And uh, a lot of really amazing work over the years has been done in spite of the fact that there have been bugs in things. In fact, in some cases, uh, like some of the work that uh, Dr. Grace Hopper did um, many years ago, um, there were actually literally bugs in the computers. And, uh, and here you have the illustration um, on the screen right here showing an actual moth that appeared in one of the computers that created a problem um, in one of the, the projects that uh, Dr. Hopper was working on. But really, at the end of the day, what's important to realize is that good designs assume that mistakes will happen, and it's important to design taking into consideration that there will be bugs and errors and mistakes. Okay, so it's important that you build knowing that there are going to be errors. And one of the great stories about people ignoring uh, the, the need for error checking um, happened during one of the Apollo missions. And um, Margaret Hamilton was a computer programmer uh, involved in, in, the, uh, in one of these launches. And she had advocated for error checking to be included in the Apollo code. And uh, her supervisors basically told her that, no, we don't need it because uh, astronauts are perfect. We've trained them so well. And at the end of the day, one of the buttons that wasn't supposed to be pushed during the flight was pushed. And, um, and, and part of the software uh, was erased in the process of doing that. So it's important to, to point out that even if you think errors aren't going to happen, they will. And it's important to, to build that into, into your systems. Now, just in case um, it might appear on the final exam, I do recommend that you read the story about Margaret Hamilton's work. Uh, you'll find it at Wired at this particular web address. Okay, so we want to talk about error checking and, and checking to see the correctness of, of software. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how do you try and figure out if the code that you wrote is truly correct? What are the tests that you can do to verify the actual correctness of your system? Okay. The other thing that we want to talk about is, is whether this is actually important. And from the perspective of um, sort of societal needs and societal expectations, are we supposed to, to make sure that our code or our programs or our systems are, in fact, correct? Are there maybe... Um, biomedical reasons, biomedical applications, um, like pacemakers, or maybe flight control systems, or maybe traffic control systems that rely on the fact that the systems are in fact operating exactly like we assume that they're going to operate, that they are in fact correct. And I guess the answer to that is, is self-evident. Yes, society expects us to, to create um, engineered systems that are really, really good and as close to correct as we can possibly make them. Okay, so the first, one of the first things that we need to talk about here is, is it possible to have provably, provably correct code? And, and, and basically what it means is that um, you have an unambiguously specified piece of software that does something in a mathematically provable um, way. And there are courses that you can take at York that talk about that. So ECS 3342 and 4315 are two courses that you might want to consider taking down the road to talk about the uh, mathematical correctness of software. Now, when we talk about software testing, uh, there's a distinction made between levels of testing and methods for testing. Okay, so in terms of levels, we, in this particular course, are only going to really talk about unit testing. So the basic types of testing that we can do, sort of one block at a time. The other thing that, uh, that we're going to talk about in a future talk is uh, the difference between two different types of te testing methods, um, one being white box testing and the other one being black box testing. And we'll talk about those later on. 
Okay, so in terms of unit testing, what are we talking about? Well, really, we're talking about testing in little baby steps. And, and you might have actually done this intuitively anyway. Effectively, what it means is that you start with the simplest device that you've got or subsystem and you test it. And then once you've tested it and made sure that that particular unit is okay, then you move on to the next one. So for instance, when you plug in those fidget boards, one of the first things to do to make sure that things are working out okay is to check that you've applied power. Um, and then if you've applied power, is the power being applied properly? Is it the right sort of current, the right sort of voltages, etc.? Another thing that you can test is the integrity of the, say, the USB cable. So you could check USB. So you could check your individual cables and you could either visually inspect them or behaviorally inspect them, or you could get little devices that, little dongles that can plug into the USB cable itself to verify that things are occurring properly, like this charge connection uh, dongle right here. You can also test to see if blocks of your code are working one unit at a time. And this is where that breakpoint business that we had spoken about earlier in the semester really comes into play, where you can step through sections of your code and verify that the code itself is working properly one little piece at a time. So debug modes and breakpoints, super important. Okay. So for unit testing, a unit test seeks to verify the functionality of a specific of a specific part of a program, usually a single function. Okay, So you can break it down into single functions and test a single function, or maybe it's a big block of code and you want to verify that one block of code. But basically you want to verify the functionality. So the goal is to find errors in the individual parts of the program. And uh, if you find that there are no errors, there is no guarantee okay, that there aren't any errors, but at least for the most part, um, you found that that individual part is correct. Um, and so you've got a, a relative level of confidence in, in the correctness of that, that piece of code. On the other hand, if you do find errors, then you've actually found out that there's an error. So the fact that you haven't found an error doesn't mean that there aren't any. It's just under the tests that you've tested uh, or, or sort of enacted, there are there are no detected errors. There might be little ones somewhere buried in there that you haven't tested for. Um, on the opposite hand, if you have tested and you have discovered errors, great. You can now uh, move on to fix those particular errors. So the basic idea with unit testing is that you are creating test cases for this, the function that you want to test. And those test cases are very specific to that particular function. Um, so if you're doing uh, a test on, say, printing to a display, you're not going to be testing for audio. You're not going to be testing for, I don't know, um, a disk functionality or something like that. You're going to be testing for things that are related to the display. Um, and so you're going to want to have your test cases specific to that particular function. Um, so you could be looking at um, the input arguments to a particular function, and you can compare it or contrast it to the expected output of that function. And then for every test case, you are verifying that the function produces the expected output for each of the given inputs. And really what ends up happening here is you want to make sure that um, you're testing as broadly as you can within sort of practical constraints um, to make sure that you test for every single possible or practical input condition and make sure that for each one of those, the output is correct. Okay, so okay, so you know one possibility here is to test for um, individual MATLAB functions, and uh, in this particular case, we'd be looking at say the function for real square root. So real square root is a function that returns the square root of each element of an array x. And array x must contain only non-negative real numbers. The size of y, the output right here, is the same size as the size of x, the input. So we have inputs and we have outputs. 
Now, what are the, some of the things that we could use to test in this particular case? Well, we could test for both uh, negative and positive numbers. Okay, we could test for negative um, integers and floating point. We could test for positive integers and floating point. We could test for positive integers and floating points, so a mixture of those, as well as negative integers and floating points and a mixture of those. We could test for a mixture of both negative and positive uh, integers and floating points and see what the result is. We could also test um, for the size. So we could test for uh, arrays that are, say, two by two. We could test for arrays that are more than that. Let's say they could be three by three. We could test for really, really big arrays as well, 10 by 10, 20 by 20. And we could see if it does actually return the square roots. So there are lots of possible test conditions that you could have for the real square root function. And at the end of the day, you want to be able to check that the result matches the expected output. And how could you do that? Well, you could write a MATLAB function. So you could write a MATLAB function that has an array of test conditions that iterates through those test conditions, checking the a real square root function one at a time. And you could test um, for each of those individual input conditions, a known um, or assumed output condition as well that you would also program in manually. You could also write algorithms uh, with equations uh, they could go through a, a, a bigger set of possible outcomes. So there are lots of ways that you could do this. Um, but the uh, at the end of the day, what you want to make sure is that you are considering how you would go about doing that testing and how and to figure out how broad you would want that testing to be. Okay. Now, effectively, what we're getting at here is the possibility of using something called an oracle. And by an oracle, yeah, the, the matrix has a really good um, sort of interpretation of what an oracle is. But an oracle effectively is an expert, an expert that can do prediction. And so what I'm hinting at with the testing of real square root is that you could write a script in MATLAB that knows what's supposed to be happening. Effectively, an expert condition or an expert system that could say for any given input, here is what we really should be testing for. And uh, you can set these up in different programming languages. Say you've got a really good example of an oracle in, say, Maple. And you want to use that Maple oracle, which you know has been tested rigorously by mathematicians and experts. And you want uh, Maple, for instance, to test some MATLAB function that you have invented or that uh, MATLAB has. And it's one way that people uh, verify the functionality of one piece of software versus a known other piece of good software. So you can sort of mix and match oracles from one manufacturer um, against code that is being developed or has been developed by another manufacturer, for instance. So classically, an oracle is a person who, who has predictions of the future, often inspired by some deity, some, some divine power. And they're really, they really are used um, in the software industry, in the engineering industry, to provide expected results for tests. And we have these comparisons between what the Oracle says and what the actual result is from that piece of software. Now, in a previous class, we talked about using uh, a masking function to determine the average value within a certain range. Um, of the color orange for particular um, orange, red, and green peppers. And you were given a piece of code uh, that was supposed to do that calculation. Now, you could actually run a test, a unit test, within MATLAB to see if that particular piece of code would work. And so I'd like you to reflect on, on, the, on how you would go about testing to see if the average color 
that we showed in that image of, of red and green and yellow peppers would actually work. Consider how maybe you could tie in um, RGB color tables from some of those web pages that you use during the flipped classroom. All right. Now, two things come from this, uh, or two things come from the discussion about masking functions and a, about this particular code that I'd like to now highlight. The first is um, the word mask, masked or masking. And it has to do, I guess the, the closest equivalent would be masking tape. So if you're confused about why we took that original image of the uh, peppers and we got rid of all the non-oranges, we made them all black and we call that masking. I'd like to point you to the video that I'm showing here using the bit.ly links about using masking tape and actual painting with a paintbrush and how masking tape helps protect certain areas of the canvas from the paint. That's effectively what we're doing when we're masking in computer code as well. Now the other thing is I want to give you a giant hint that the code that we showed you doesn't in fact calculate the average value of orange. There is a mistake in the code and um, I'd like you to try and figure out what that mistake is and maybe you could try and do um, a testing regime, some testing function within MATLAB to verify whether or not it's actually calculating the average value of orange. Okay, so I have a challenge for you, something to think about before that final exam. Let's imagine that you have written a MATLAB function that takes some arbitrary vector full of numbers and then takes all the numbers in that vector and sorts them from uh, smallest to largest, that is in ascending order. So it takes all of the numbers that, that are in the vector and rearranges them, starting with the smallest and moving up to the largest. How would you actually test to see that that, uh, that function actually worked? Could you write another function that would call this new function that you wrote and put in arbitrary values of, uh, of vectors in there and then return uh, the values and see if it actually worked. Could you do those test cases and how would you report the success of those test cases? So that's a challenge exercise to think about before that final exam. All right, good luck everyone and we'll talk to you soon.